Well, welcome. Welcome to the ISA On Point uh, presentations. Today we're having a, an overview of PHA HAZOP studies featuring Dean Shearing and Karen Nielsen. And uh, on the next slide, we can see um, Karen's and Dean's uh, credentials. They're chemical engineers with many years of experience in the process industries in various fields. And they've done a lot of work in HAZOP and we're taking advantage of their kind service in explaining um, HAZOP and how to best implement HAZOP studies. So um, thank you very much, Karen. She'll um, go through uh, the next part of the presentation uh, and I'll uh, sign off for now. Thank you very much, Simon. Well, let me take you through a little bit about HAZOPS first and where it sits in the safety management system, and then we'll, we'll get on with talking about HAZOPS. So a typical safety management system looks something like this with a series of key features that come together to um, help ensuring that a processing facility operates operates safely. Um, importantly, it includes a requirement to identify hazards and risks, and this is where HAZOPs sit. So, well, the HAZOP study has a defined level of importance for it to work. It needs to sit within the safety management system, so it can't sit outside it, it's not a panacea, uh, it has to work within the safety management system. So let's spend some more time talking about the HAZOP study technique in itself. I'm going to present to you what a HAZOP study is all about, why it's such a great and flexible hazard identification technique that has been in existence for quite some time. Uh, I'll give you a number of key features to do with timing, team, inputs, etc. And I'll give you a, a tool to expand it to work for major projects or major modifications to an existing facility. And then I will hand over to Dean Schuring who will take us through a practical application of the HAZOP study technique and will apply it to a few faults and errors. So first of all, HAZOP can be defined as a system to systematically review a process by a group of experienced people in order to identify deviations from the normal design intent, which may lead to hazardous events or significant operability problems. It relies on three major components. The first one is that it's a systematic technique which is used to identify, i.e. not always solve potential hazards and operating problems. The second, is that it's conducted by a group of experienced people who methodically assess the process in a brainstorming environment. And the third pillar is that it relies on this creative interaction of a team from diverse disciplines to stimulate creativity and to generate ideas. We often use the concept of a multidisciplinary team to describe, describe this component. ICI UK invented the technique in 1960 to analyze major chemical process systems with a pioneering work by Bert Lawley, who's described as the inventor, and by Trevor Kletz and Ellis Knowlton. It gained notoriety with it within the chemical industry after the process failure at Flixborough. Uh, that was a disaster that occurred in 1974, where a major industrial facility was destroyed 
after what is believed to have been a failure to identify and manage the risk of loss of containment and subsequent vapor cloud explosion, which destroyed the facility. The technique was further developed by the UK Chemical Industries Association, UKCIA, in 1970s and became more and more widely used in the 80s with major chemical and petroleum process industries coming on board. And other types of industries, such as mineral processing, food and water industries, following suit in the late 80s and 90s. The international standard, IEC 61882, called HAZOP Studies Application Guide, was developed in 2001. Initially, the technique was focused on process industry. In later years, the technique has been expanded to include also other types of industry. For example, ICI ran its first computer or control HAZOP in 1993 or thereabouts, and other applications were being developed around that same time, including for electrical systems, train protection, materials handling, etc. Road designs started to use the technique in the early 2000s, including to develop road safety barriers and under road safety features. Whilst there's been improvement in HAZOP study efficiency and quality over the years, the basic methodology has remained unchanged. The objectives of HAZOP study are to facilitate safe plant startup, minimize need for, on, for modifications, and maintain online time. Add these now, the need to identify all safety, health, and environmental hazards, and wherever possible, determine the inherent structure of new hazardous event. That latter point, to determine the inherent structure of the hazard is useful in determining the critical control measures for either prevention or mitigation safeguards. When properly recorded, the results of a HAZOP study can be used as input to other techniques, such as LOPAS, safety and integrity level determinations, risk assessments, quantitative risk assessments, emergency planning, fire safety study, to name a few. This diagram represents the structure of the hazards. During a HAZOP study, the approach is to brainstorm the initiating event and then analyze what could happen next, i.e. the intermediate events and up to the potential consequences. When this, the discussion is free flowing and follows the evolution of an incident from a potential, possibly small, insignificant trigger through to a potentially major incident. The initiating event, a brainstorm, without initially identifying the ultimate consequences. This means that the team will discuss events before having established whether they can cause any consequences of significance. For example, the initiating event maybe a pump running against a closed valve, which could occur through a failure of hardware or management system, that is human error. This event may, as an intermediate event, develop overpressure and generation of excessive heat. The potential consequences may be a loss of containment of flammable fluids, which catch, catches fire and or a rupture of the pump casing resulting in missiles, ultimately with potential for injury, environmental pollution, and damage to property. The original HAZOP study technique was based on a set of general guide words that were combined with the process parameters uh, and or the design intentions to detect potential deviation from the design intent, 
that may lead to hazardous events or significant operability problems. Examples of such guide words are these no, not none, which means a complete negation of the design intent. For example, no forwarding flow when there should be. More of could be a quantitative increase of the design intent. For example, increased flow, flow for too long, pressures increasing or temperatures increasing, etc. Less of may mean meaning of a quantitative decrease of one of the process parameters. Each of the above guide words is combined with an intention, such as flowing a liquid at a certain rate from one vessel to the other. This combination is the deviation that the HAZOP study evaluates. The team brainstorms credible causes for the deviation and then work themselves up the pyramid to the intermediate consequences, such as a high level in a tank or a high pressure upstream of a system, and the ultimate consequences, such as overflow or burst vessel resulting in harm to people, the environment, property, and business. For each cause consequence combination for the one deviation, the team assesses whether the existing and proposed safeguards are adequate. And in this way, they're performing a qualitative risk assessment. If the team determines the existing and proposed safeguards to be adequate, then move to the next cause consequence combination. If the team decides that the existing and proposed safeguards are not adequate, then they will either suggest an improvement or if not able to come up with an improvement within a reasonable time frame, for example, a 10 minute um, maximum duration, then the issue is minuted as such for further investigation and the team will move on to the next cause consequence combination. Remember that the aim of a HAZOP is not to solve every issue, but to identify potential problems. An extension of these guide words was undertaken by ICI, which resulted in a set of flip cards containing potential deviation and prompts relating to causes and deviations. This is an extremely flexible way of approaching things. And the reason I think why HAZOP can be used for such a great variety of industries and applications. The next two examples of guide word set are summarized in this slide. The first is for a process HAZOP handling gas or liquids. And the second is for an electrical HAZOPs. And these are just uh, some examples. The HAZOP study facilitator needs to ensure that all relevant deviations from the design intent are evaluated during the study. The guard words are applied node by node or line by line. A typical node is shown above, simplified for illustrative purposes only. In an actual HAZOP, it's important to understand where the fluid is coming from. For example, is it hand pumped from a small IBC or is it gravity flow from a massive vessel? Where is the flow located, etc. For each node, the team chooses a guide word, look for a cause, one cause at a time. For each cause, they explore the consequences and the safeguards, take action if necessary, move to the next cause, etc. Then choose another guide word and then select another node when all guide words have been reviewed. As said previously, HAZOP is underpinned by three major components, one of which being that it relies on the team interaction by a team from diverse disciplines or backgrounds. 
a HAZOP team must comprise suitable representatives of both the designers or technical representatives and the end user. This, makes, this ensures that both the design intent and the operational constraints are fully understood and that potential operational problems and theoretical limitations to design capabilities are properly explored. To reduce the chance that a possible problem could be overlooked, it's important that participants be selected with a wide variety of experience and expertise. To enable a balanced decision to be made about possible costly modification, it is important that the participants include people responsible for and able to authorize expenditure and people able to advise with recognized authority on safety and operational requirements. For an efficient HAZOP study, members should be limited to a maximum of eight people wherever possible. IEC 61882, the application guide for HAZOPS, sets the number of team members as four to rarely more than seven. The HAZOP study leader should be able to control team membership. As of study preparation is important, um, and it's important that proper attention is put to this. The success of the HAZOP depends largely on the effectiveness of the preparation. Um, and the HAZOP study leader is usually the person who's set to as responsible for this activity. The preparation includes the following. The team membership needs to be decided, um, ensuring that the meeting facilities are required, assessing the need to pre-train team members, whether it is in the facility or modification being studied or in the hazard study technique in general. The order of the review needs to be decided and um, the methodology for the HAZOP that's the most uh, suited for the study needs to be defined. For example, is it a batch study or a continuous process? Do you need special applications? Um, is it materials handling? Is it computer-based system? And this includes a draft plan for the order of systems to be reviewed. A checking of the times required for the meeting and a review of the guide word is also required, ensuring suitability to the process under study, checking the quality of the documentation to be used and making sure it's available during the study, deciding on who's going to take the minutes and making sure they're properly briefed and equipped, and performing your own personal preparation as required. For example, refreshing knowledge of material hazards or incidents that may have occurred in industry elsewhere. HAZOP can be said to be an audit of a complete, completed design. Hence, for best result, it needs to be conducted at a detailed process design stage, proving that you're able to start constructing. Therefore, it needs to be based on a number of design reviews, including the basis of design, which includes your flows, your pressures, your temperatures, the material construction, which includes your gaskets, your layout, um, if available, and this would be our preferred approach, that you also have your 2D and 3D reviews completed, preferably including um, for operability, maintainability and access. Your major protection features detailed, including functional descriptions, including cause and effects diagrams, process shutdowns, emergency shutdowns, et cetera, defined, pressure relief and blowdown studies completed, your fire safety strategy, 
um, conducted, your containment strategy established, etc. The standard hazard study minute sheet or record sheet is shown on this slide. On this slide, apart from the columns discussed above, guide word, cause, consequence, safeguards, and actions. It includes information on the project, the node under review, the identification of the drawings, including the revision, the team membership, including the leader and the minute taker, and the date of the study. Each entry, which in fact means each cause, has a distinct identifying number or letter. Each action also has a distinct ID. If there are more than one action for a particular cause, then each action must be given its own ID. For a particular project, it's important not to go back to number one, etc. This means you don't start number one for a new guide word or a new system or a new day. That's particularly important if you're exporting the results from the HAZOP into layers of protection analysis studies or seal determination. There are two types of minute recording. The first is minutes by, by, by exception, which means you only record minutes that result in an action for follow-up after the study. That was the original way we minuted. Full recording are all scenarios are minuted whether they give rise to follow-up actions or not. The latter doesn't result in recording of all words spoken. Both types of minute recording are discussed in most HAZOP application guides. We recommend to record at the minimum all items that result in an action and all significant points of discussion. This normally means items resulting in significant consequence impact, even if the existing and proposed safeguards were deemed as adequate by the team. Risk management strategy for development of major projects and major modifications to an existing plant requires close attention to the control of hazards, preferably by elimination. This is aided by the application of a series of six distinct formal studies called hazard studies from the early stages of project development through to operation. This means this method of assessment was applied by the inventor of the HAZOP study, ICI, and then later by ORICA Australia um, after the sale by ICI to Australia, to ICI Australia. During the studies, the concept of inherent safety and the hierarchy of controls are applied. The timing of the various studies is important to maximize the impact. Has a study one, is essentially a review of the project process and materials to identify major project showstoppers and major opportunities for inherent safe design. As a study two is carried out at the process flow stage and it serves at identifying major hazards and major preventative and protective strategies. That is a top up type studies where the hazards are fires, explosion, release of toxics, etc. Has the study one and two are carried out at the development and project specification stages and prior to sanction of a project. Sorry, change. I'll start from the beginning of this slide. Risk management strategy for the development of major projects or major modifications to an existing plant requires close attention to the control of hazards, preferably by elimination. This is aided by the application of a series of six 
distinct formal studies called hazard studies from the earliest design through to operation. This method of assessment was applied by ICI and then later after the sale of ICI Australia to Orica Australia by Orica. During the studies, the concepts of inherent safety and a hierarchy of controls are applied. The timing of the various studies is important to maximize the impact. Hazard study one is essentially a review of the project process and materials to identify the major project showstoppers and a great timing for for identifying opportunities for inherent safe design. Hazard study two is carried out at the process flow sheet stage and serves at identifying major hazards and major preventative and protective strategies. Hazard, study, hazard, hazard studies one and two are carried out at the development and project specification stage and uh, confirmation of completion of these studies is required as part of the sanction project, uh, procedure. Hazard study three, which is the HAZOP, is carried out as soon as suitable design information is available. CHAZOP or computer or control HAZOP is a variation of the HAZOP. It is carried out at a similar stage of the project, usually after the HAZOP. As a study four and five are pre-commissioning studies and must be completed before process materials are introduced. And as a study six is a study of initial operation and is to be completed not earlier than three and not later than six months after beneficial production. I'm now going to hand over to Dean. He's going to take us through some practical application of the HAZOP study. Well, thanks, Karen, and welcome, everyone. Now it's an opportunity to have a look at how the HAZOP technique works in practice. We've developed a simple process diagram here. It's not a full PNID by any means, but uh, initially I'll overview this process, and then we're going to explore three HAZOP deviations. As you can see up the top up here, the first deviation will be associated with control system failure. The second deviation we're gonna run through is associated with the human error. And the third deviation we'll explore is a mechanical failure one. So on the process, we've essentially got uh, hydrocarbons uh, initially being pumped into a distillation column just here. The low boiling point materials come off the top of the distillation column in the overhead stream. The higher boiling point materials come down to the bottom and they leave the column as liquids. The column itself is operated at 12 bar. Now, for the liquids that come down the bottom, some of those liquids pass through a steam heated reboiler where vapor is generated and that vapour flows up through the trays and that allows the separation process to work. The remaining liquid passes through a level control valve. We drop the pressure across that level control valve from 12 to three bar. So we generate two phase flow in that line and we flash uh, some of that liquid. The flash vapour is controlled off to a compressor that way through PCV1, and the flash liquid is taken off from the flash tank through LCV2. A little bit more detail on the drawing, the level in the sump of the column is controlled through LC1 with both a high and a low alarm. Bit more detail around maintenance requirements. We have the ability to isolate LCV1 upstream through V1, and downstream through V3. And if we need to drain before we open up the pipe for maintenance, we can open up V2. 
that reduction in pressure across there from 12 to 3 bar in our two-phase flow enters our flash tank. Because the flash tank is a pressure vessel, it has a pressure safety valve uh, on the tank, which is set for 4 bar G. The pressure within the flash tank is controlled by PIC1, sending a signal through to PCV1, and hence that flash vapour flows off to a downstream compressor. The remaining liquid from the two-phase flow entering the flash tank is controlled under LC, LC2 level control there in the flash tank, which regulates LCV2, and that flash liquid goes off for further processing. As the process involves flammable liquids, we have a bunded area to contain any spills if they occur. So yes, it's a simplistic diagram, but it's basically developed for showing how the HAZOP technique works for these three causes for deviations. So initially we're going to explore a control system failure deviation. I'm going to explore with a little help from some friends, uh, we're gonna do a HAZOP reenactment of what could cause high flow in this line here. So all right team, if you were to think through what could cause high flow in this column's bottoms pipe, what would they be? Well, LC1, uh, that's controlling the level. It could be reading too high, thinking it's got a level when it doesn't, maybe due to calibration fault. All right, that's a good suggestion. So what happens if LC1 reads too high? Oh, it actually will try to open up that valve and um, it'll, it'll give a a, um, a lower than normal level. And in the worst case, it might completely empty out that uh, sump and lose completely lose the level. Okay, so what are the consequences when this occurs? Uh, high pressure vapor can blow through the flash tank and possibly lead to consequences, over pressure. And this will lead to? Oh, well, the flash tank vapor vent PCV1 isn't sized for this scenario. Um, then the flash tank could rupture and could end up releasing flammable vapors and liquids. If they get ignited, you could end up with a flash fire or, or explosion. Projectiles could also occur. Okay, so there's potential for harm to personnel and damage to equipment. What are the safeguards to prevent or mitigate? This scenario? Well, the, um, the, the level measurement and level controller is um, maintained yearly. Uh, there's a pressure safety valve on the flash tank, which is so sized for this scenario, and the instruments and the electrics in the area are rated for hazardous zones. Are there any other safeguards? No, not that I can see. No, no. No. Okay. All right. Are these safeguards adequate? No, I believe we should install a separate low level switch on the column that closes an additional actuated on off valve in continuous bottom pipe, say immediately upstream of LCV1. We should avoid lifting the pressure safety valve as much as possible. We should also perform a layer of protection analysis to confirm this is adequate protection. Yeah, they're great suggestions. Is everyone in agreement with these suggestions? Yep. 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 Sounds good, good to me. Okay, I'll mark up the drawing, uh, the master has a pin ID to show that change, and I'll also record the need for a LOPA study. So we'll just mark up the master drawing basically to show a little switch like that. And as Pramod said, put in the actuator valve in that bottom line at that location and the details of that loop can be engineered later on. Well, that's a good scenario. Now, the next deviation I want to explore is high level. And this will be a human error cause, this one. So I'll start with the, uh, with the column. So, all right, guys, what could cause high level in the column? 
Well, perhaps after maintenance, uh, manual isolation valve V1 or and or V3 could be left closed, and okay. we've got no way of knowing that from the from the control room. Alrighty. So, what are the consequences of this? The level in the column will rise. Okay, so level goes up here. And what are the consequences when the level in the column increases? Well, if you get the, the level above the vapour return line from the reboiler, then you end up with two-phase flow moving up through the trays, and that could cause damage to those trays. Is there any risk of a release from this scenario? No, not that I can see. I think that the problem is internal column damage, which is costly. All righty. So what are the safeguards to prevent or mitigate this scenario? Yeah, well, it's, it's the same as before. The um, level loop LC1 is maintained yearly. Uh, the operators can respond to the high-level alarm from this instrument and pre-start uh, checklist to ensure that the isolation valves are in the correct position. Now, are these safeguards adequate to protect the column internals? No. I recommend we should install a separate high-level switch on the column that will stop the column feed, that is, trip the in upstream column of feed pump. Yeah. That's a good idea. Is everyone happy with this suggestion? Yep. Yeah, so good, idea. good idea. All right, I'll mark this high level switch on the PNID and we would show it in a similar fashion to that, just on the master drawing in the HAZOP study. And then we proceed to the next scenario. The next scenario we're going to explore is a mechanical failure. Uh, leading to a deviation from the design intent. I'm going to stick with level and we're going to do basically explore credible causes for high level in the flash tank. All right, so our third and last scenario, team, what could cause high level in the column? Uh, what could cause high level in the flash tank? Apologies. Well, that uh, level control valve 2, LCB2, could be stuck closed. It is a fail closed valve. And what will this lead to? Well, the flash tank level will increase. You can end up with liquid coming up uh, in the line to the compressors. And once liquid gets into the compressors, what's going to happen then? As the compressor is a positive displacement piston style compressor, then there can be a loss of containment of flammable vapor and liquid, for example, from a failed cylinder gasket. And the worst case consequences for this scenario would be? Well, you could uh, have ignition, for example, due to hot surface or anything really, and there, therefore you could end up with explosion within the compressor building. Um, you know, you end up with fairly severe equipment damage, maybe even fatality if a person is within or in close range to the compressor building. Uh, okay. So what are the safeguards to prevent or mitigate this scenario? It's basically our yearly maintenance program, and that includes L, um, Level Control 2 and LCB2, and the instruments and the electrics are all rated for hazardous zone area. Are these safeguards adequate to protect against a potential confined explosion within the compressor building? No, we should install a separate high level switch on the flash tank that trips the column, including the closing of actuated on off valve in the column bottom frames, and also perform a layer of protection analysis to confirm this additional safeguard reduces the risk to an adequate level. Yeah, more good suggestions. Is everyone in agreement? Yep. 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 Yes, sir. Okay, so I'll mark this uh, high level switch on the PNID, shown like that, and we'll record the need for a LOPA study as well. That, that's basically three scenarios that show how the HAZOP technique works in practice. So in terms of uh, minute recording. 
If you go back to example number one, we're exploring credible causes for high flow in that uh, column bottoms pipe. Now, if you recall the suggestion that was made by uh, Karen, the level controller could be reading too high. Now, the consequences are summarised this way. We essentially start at the bottom of the pyramid, which Karen showed earlier on in the presentation. So low level in the column with a potential for gas blow by to the flash tank. As the flash tank vapour vent control valve, PC1, is not sized for the scenario, then there is a potential for overpressure and rupture. So we're working our way up the pyramid right now. This can lead to projectiles, a flash fire and or explosion, which can injure people, including fatality and damage equipment. So we're at the worst case consequences, the top of the pyramid. We summarise the existing safeguards that were suggested. LC1 had the yearly maintenance. There was a pressure safety valve on the flash tank and the instruments and electrics are rated for hazardous zones. That's essentially a mitigation safeguard to lower the likelihood of ignition. The actions that we recorded uh, uh, install a low level switch on the column, which is to close a new actuated on off valve in the column bottoms pipe. This new valve is to be located immediately upstream of LCV1 so that it can be isolated for maintenance. The second action, perform a layer of protection analysis, or LOPA, to confirm this additional safeguard reduces risk to an acceptable level. Put in who's responsible, in this case Simon, and the date when it needs to get done by, and that's how we would record that scenario. The other two scenarios are done exactly the same way. So credible cause for deviation, if you remember, that was the human error, uh, leaving the manual valves closed. Roll through the pyramid, so the intermediate consequences, and in that case, the ultimate consequential impact was damage to the trays. We had a summary of the safeguards, so yearly maintenance, operator response to alarm, and pre-start checklist. And then the team agreed within 10 minutes to install a separate high-level switch on the column that'll trip the feed. Again, responsibility and when it needs to get done by. And the third scenario, how it would get uh, summarised is this one here, much the same as what we've seen in those last two. So credible cause, in this case, it was a mechanical failure. That led to a level increase in the flash tank, liquid carrying over to a positive displacement compressor, which is not gonna like trying to compress liquid. We're gonna get uh, loss of containment, so it could be a failed cylinder gasket. So we get gas liquid coming out of that. Uh, chance of ignition, because it's within a confined building, uh, there's a potential for a confined explosion. If someone is present either within or nearby the compressor building, there's a chance for fatality. Worst case outcome. Again, summarise the existing safeguards. They weren't deemed to be adequate by the team. So we came up with installing the separate high level switch on the flash tank, which is basically going to be a cold trip, and we also did a LOPA. So in practice, that's how this technique flows. So if you recall Karen's slides from earlier on, we explore credible causes for deviations from the design intent. Now, once we've got a credible cause for a deviation, we go through the consequences to the worst case outcome, and that's harm to people, the environment, property of the business, what are the existing safeguards and are they adequate? If the team do not believe the existing safeguards are adequate, they then allow 10 minutes to solve it. If they solve it in approximately 10 minutes, you end up with an action that says install. If they cannot solve it within 10 minutes, for example, further calculations might be required, then you'll end up with an action that says review the need, right? Perform an assessment and then the study keeps flowing. Because the third pillar that you saw earlier on, uh, on the HAZOP technique, is sustaining creative brainstorming. Spending too long trying to solve an action will kill our creativity, and therefore the HAZOP will suffer. Very simple technique, but when done well, which is basically 
identifying all possible credible causes for deviations of the design intent process parameters, exploring systematically the consequences. What are the safeguards? Are they adequate? When done well, the chances of missing something are very low indeed. And that's fundamentally the reason why the HAZOP technique is so flexible and so successful is because you can apply that methodology to any process that exists because all you're doing is taking the design intent, the relevant process parameters, and flowing through are they credible causes, what's the worst case consequences, what are the safeguards, are they adequate, do we need further action. So when done well, this technique does save lives, very worthwhile. So with that, Simon, I'm going to hand back to you and we'll catch up with everyone in a few weeks' time if you have any queries. Okay, thank you, Dean. Um, and thank you, Karen, for a very informative session. Um, and just um, as, a, as a reminder or as a new note to the, to the ISA membership, we will be having our a Connect Live Q&A Town Hall where Dean and Karen have kindly um, accepted to um, answer questions. All questions I will answer, I believe. Um, so uh, I look forward to that and there'll be a notice coming out sometime in, in late September, uh, for a late September uh, session. Um, and if you want to uh, contact Dean and Karen, well, here's their slide, and they always want to talk about HAZOP. So that uh, that's their life. So with that, I thank you very much, and um, I hope you got something out of this uh, presentation. Thank you all. <laughs>